every one of you can stand and worship with us this morning. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever is yours. Heaven and earth bow down in the wonder of your name. Heaven is broken and the glory forever is yours. Nothing can overcome the power of your name. King above the universe will sing everlasting God you are wonderful you are wonderful and the shout of the earth be your praise God forever and the light of to all be your Forever on the power of your name King above King all the universe will sing everlasting God you are wonderful you are wonderful and the shout of the earth be your praise God forever and the light of to all be your forever all the glory Lord is yours King above King all the universe will sing everlasting God you are wonderful you are wonderful King above King all the universe will sing everlasting God Welcome you here to Huntington CMA. Uh, glad to have you with us this morning. Looks like a good crowd. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity on this beautiful spring morning to come and worship you. Pray that you would be with us, that you would help us to focus on you, bringing our praise and our worship, that you'd be with Pastor Aaron as he brings the message, and that uh, it would speak to our hearts. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.
good, good part. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good part. Father God, as we come to you today, Lord, we just thank you for what you've done for us, Father. And as we take this time to give back a portion of what you've given us, we just pray that you take it, Lord, place it where it needs to be. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're changing things up again this morning. We're doing announcements now. Um, one important one, we're required by the bylaws to review the bylaws every year or two. And we uh, got the committee together. We reviewed the bylaws and made some revisions. We also have to present it to the congregation at least two th weeks before the congregational meeting to vote on it. So the revised bylaws are now available. Um, I think a lot of people received a notice maybe sometime during the week that the resource is available. I think it's available under your Sunday school class. Uh, if not, you can call up the church office, ask Gwen, and she'll either email you a copy or print out a copy for you to, uh, to pick up. So we'll make those available for you to review. And then on May 5th, some people have been wanting an ice cream social. Well, here's your chance. We're going to have an ice cream social to do a Q&A on the bylaws. That'll be on May 5th. Uh, and then preparation for the annual meeting later in the month. Now we have, you know, I just looked at my calendar. It's two months, nine weeks, or 63 days until VBS. Whichever causes you the most urgency, think of it that way. Here we have an announcement from the director. Thank you, honey. Yeah, I'm just going with two months. It's two months before VBS, and obviously I need um, volunteers. Mainly what I would love is volunteers for prayer. Um, Chelsea is in charge, as she's walking in, is in charge of prayer this year, which is great. Um, not only praying now, and she's been really good about putting specific prayer requests in each week in your bulletin, so make sure you check that, um, because nothing happens in the life of a church or in someone's heart without prayer. So please, please pray. Um, but we also will need people to pray during that week while we were at VBS. Um, it's really important because things come up, we have issues with kids or there's an emergency or whatever. I love to have people praying in the building while we're having VBS because just to have VBS bathed in prayer is so, so important. So. I also need someone in charge of the preschool area. I do have several volunteers who will be happy to help, but I need someone in charge. I cannot do both. Just, no, so please, someone. Um, I also need lifeguard leaders, which is, <laughs> this year, the theme is Breaker Rock Beach. Um, standing on the truth, on God's truth in a world of shifting sands. 
So a lot of the things is about, you know, Beechworth. So lifeguard leaders are our people who take the kids from place to place. You are the ones who get to know the kids. Okay, I don't get to know every kid. The people who are at the different rotations don't necessarily get to know, but you are the ones that the kids really get attached to. So you're extremely important. But the lucky thing for you, there's not a lot of prep work for that. You just have to love on the kids. Easy peasy. Okay, so I need a lot of those. Um, also, check the bulletin board. Um, right by the fireside room, that's where I am putting a lot of the things that I need for VBS, the supplies I need for VBS. Um, and check it every week because I'm getting new things that I need every week from my rotation leaders, plus as I get, we do more decorations, I need more stuff. Um, anyhow, volunteers, this is your little insert. On one side is where you can print it out. On the other side, there is a QR code, so I don't have to put your name in. That would be great. If you could use a QR code, it takes you to the registration for the adults. Starting probably in two weeks, it will be flipping over to the kids' registration. So, um, so register either that or hand me or one of the ushers the um, sheets so we can get volunteers so I know what you would like to do because there is a place for everyone in VBS. Youth, please, I need you guys because the kids relate to you guys more than someone old like me. So, thank you. And our other announcement is a new ministry that Tim is starting. Let him, uh, I think, start with a video. Look at our deputy sheriff sleeping like a baby. Let him be. Think of this, sir. Oh, uh, uh, baby, have you got any any uh, lipstick in your purse? Yes, why? Oh, could I borrow it? What are you looking for? Oh, not nothing. Just let let me borrow it. Joe Waters has got his truck parked a little too close to that fire hydrant. You, you want to tell him to move? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll tell him. Hey, Joe. You got your truck right up here to that fire hydrant. Move it out of here. Sure, Barney. Sure. <laughs> Joe Waters. Why? He just threw me a kiss. <laughs> uh, I don't blame him, Barney. With that lipstick all over your face, you do look kind of sweet. <laughs> oh, boy. You're just full of fun today, aren't you? Why don't we go up to the old people's home and wax the steps? <laughs>
get to the scripture for today, which is uh, a little one, difficult one for us who are leaders of the church because it gives the qualifications that we are trying to live up to, hopefully more so than not, uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snar snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for on dishonest gain. He must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children in their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Duane. Well, for those of you who are concerned that our new normal is going to be uh, about 10 to 15 minutes of announcements in the morning, don't worry about it. We're good. That was today. We have a lot going on. We needed to take the time for it. That's why we reordered our service just a little bit, but it's not going to just be a different thing each week when you come in here. So take a breath. We're going to be okay. We're going to make it through it together. Good morning. Welcome. Thanks for being here. I'm grateful. I'm glad to see all of you at Huntington Christian Missionary Alliance Church. Would you join me for a word of prayer before we hop into our message? Lord, it seems that as we work our way through 1 Timothy, the words that you gave Paul to write to this church leader so long ago just seem to not let us off the hook. One message after another, we seem to be consistently challenged. That's a good thing. But Lord, it makes us uncomfortable. <laughs> Lord, as we read that list of qualifications for some of us this morning, it just becomes overwhelming. It becomes challenging. Father, would you help us to receive that challenge? Lord, as we're looking at this passage this morning, the overarching theme that we see is your desire for the church to be cared for, your desire for the church to be shepherded well. Lord, you're very clear in Scripture about the great love and affection that you have for the church. You even call the church your bride. Lord Jesus, would you give us the right attitude this morning as we approach, approach a challenging scripture? Lord, would you give us that same love and affection for your bride, the church? A desire to see what's best for her. A desire to grow and to be challenged and to wrestle. Father, would you give us wisdom this morning as we try to understand what it is that you've called us to? Lord, in some way or another, this morning, would you use this message to glorify yourself? This morning, would you use this message to teach us, to edify us, to encourage us, to challenge us? Father, maybe there's even those in this room this morning who need conviction. Maybe there are those who need refreshment and encouragement to be built back up. Lord Jesus, you know our hearts. You know our needs. Lord, you're the only one who can actually make any sort of difference in our lives. So, Holy Spirit, we surrender entirely to you. 
If we're not there yet, would, we, would you get us into that position of surrender and submission? Holy Spirit, would you take control? Would you have said whatever you want said? Would you restrict whatever you want restricted? Lord Jesus, we're here because we need to hear from you. We're here because we need to be ministered to by you. We need your touch, Lord Jesus. So would you have your way this morning, and would you glorify your name? Amen. Well, last week, we worked our way through that second half of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, we looked at Paul's instructions for the church primarily in that section towards women in the church. And Paul, as we talked about last week, was instructing us on some practical ways that we can live out that humble and quiet life that's peaceable and godly and dignified in every way that he started off chapter 2 talking about. As we worked our way through 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 15 last week, a part of our conversation was surrounding this topic of who should and shouldn't be leading in the church. And really today, that's where Paul is picking up. He's continuing in some ways that same theme, that same principle, and he's focusing in even more on the qualifications for those who lead in the church. So that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be unpacking Paul's instructions inspired by the Holy Spirit about what leaders in the church should look like. You guys noticed as Dwayne read this passage just a second ago, it's quite a long list of qualifications, don't you think? Poor Dwayne had to sit here and read the whole thing. We're probably going to go through it once or twice again this morning. So we're going to talk about those qualifications. We're going to talk about the picture of a godly leader in the church that's being painted for us here. But first, first, before we even actually get to those qualifications, I think we need to understand what roles, what positions, offices, Paul is even describing here for us. You see, there's two roles, two offices that we see present in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that Paul is unpacking. He's unpacking the role of elder, overseer, bishop. I know I just said three things, but it's actually describing one role, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. And then he's also unpacking the role of deacon. And he's listing the qualifications and giving some instruction, actually, to those who fill these roles. Now, before we even discuss those particular roles, some of you might be wondering, well, why is it that Paul chose those roles to discuss? Why are these the ones that we have qualifications for? And in fact, these are actually some of the only qualifications that are spelled out for us in Scripture about who should be leading and who shouldn't be. So why did Paul pick elders or overseers and deacons as the leadership roles to discuss? That's a good question. The simple answer is that really these are the only leadership roles that we actually see in the New Testament. Really, this is pretty much it. We see elders and deacons in the early church. They were the ones who led. Now, you can make an argument that there were the apostles, right? The apostles are kind of different, and we could say, well, maybe that's a different role altogether. But then we also have the apostles in 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2 John 1, 1, calling themselves elders of the church. So even the apostles, who are kind of this whole different thing, kind of their own role, they call themselves elders. So we could argue maybe that's a different kind of elder, or just the elders of the elders, kind of an elevated position of elders within the church, or something different, altogether irrelevant at the end of the day. The important thing is, in the early church, Really, the church was led by these two offices, elders slash overseers and deacons. And that was pretty much it. So when Paul is describing the qualifications for these two offices, when he's saying, here's what the leaders who lead in these areas should look like, he's really pretty much saying, here's what those who lead and serve in the church should look like. It's almost holistic altogether. He's saying everyone who leads should have these qualifications. We good there so far? Okay, a little bit of a tangent. We got a little bit off to eventually get around to actually talking about the roles that Paul is describing. I've said already that the first role that he's describing here, which in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that we just read is referred to as an overseer, is actually both an overseer and an elder. 
And we're going to explain why I'm saying that and where we see that in Scripture here. You see, in 1 Timothy 3, the word that's being used is episkopos. It's the Greek word episkopos, which has been translated at different times and in different traditions and different denominations to either mean overseer or bishop. The same exact word, same exact meaning and interpretation, just using different terms at different points in history and in different locations. So the word here in 1 Timothy 3 for overseer or bishop is episkopos. That's what Paul uses here. But in Titus 1 verses 5 to 9, we see a virtually identical list of qualifications for those who lead the church. And this term, episkopos, meaning overseer or bishop, is used in Titus chapter 1 interchangeably with the Greek word for elder, which is presbyter. So they're used interchangeably, referring to the same individuals. What we gather from that and from some other passages of Scripture that reaffirm this same principle is that we're looking at the same role in each of these positions. The elder is the overseer, is the bishop. All the same role just being referred to by three different terms in our English language at different times. Elders are overseers. And overseer is a different term for bishop. Let's look together at Titus 1, verses 5 to 9, and I'll exp- you'll be able to see a little bit what I'm talking about. Titus 1, verses 5 to 9, Paul says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders, there's that presbyter word in the Greek, elders, in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, see there's that episkopos, an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent for greedy or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good. Self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So you see where we're coming from here in saying that these three titles, three terms, elder, overseer, bishop, they're referring to this first role that Paul is describing here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The under-shepherds, to Christ, those who were called to lead and care for the church, the highest human authority in the local church who are entirely responsible for its care. That's what this role of overseer or elder is that Paul is talking about. We're going to come back around to elders in just a second and unpack what they do. But first, I want to talk about this second office that Paul is talking about here in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 to 13. And that's the office of deacon, the role of a deacon in the church. The Greek word that's used here is actually pretty easy. It's basically just a transliteration. It's diakonos in the Greek, which means one who serves or servant. So a deacon, diakonos in the Greek, is just a servant, someone who serves in the church. You see now how this kind of makes a little bit more sense that these are the two leadership roles. You've got the elders, those who lead and run and direct the church, and the servants who serve in the church, who serve under the elders and do the work of the church. And you see this word servant that it's referred to here is actually quite appropriate when we consider where we see the first deacons in Scripture. In Acts chapter 6, the very early stages of the New Testament church, the 12 apostles receive a complaint from a group who were called the Hellenists, who were Greek-speaking Jewish people. And they were saying that they were being neglected in the daily distribution of food in favor of the Hebrew-speaking orphans and widows. You see, in the early church, they had established a ministry, an important ministry, where they would take up a collection from all of the saints and they would use it to distribute food to those who couldn't care for themselves. They would feed orphans and widows who were reliant on the church to continue living. That was an important ministry, but it wasn't getting enough hands-on attention. There was too many people who needed help. There was too much going on. There was too much ministry 
to go around. And so this important ministry was becoming a little bit dysfunctional. It didn't have the hands-on care that it needed to run efficiently. So look at what the disciples do in Acts chapter 6, verses 2 to 6. We're going to read this together. Acts says, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said was pleasing to the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. They set set them before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. You see, the apostles, the high elders of the church, the highest authority that was in the early church, they had their hands full. They had a lot on their plate. Think about the movement that had started. It started with just these few people gathered in that upper room. And then within the same day at Pentecost, it expanded into thousands. They had some ministry transitions to adapt to, don't you think? Their circumstances were way more than they were prepared for or knew how to handle, and yet God was good and faithful in it. But the apostles knew that they couldn't do everything. They knew what Christ had called them to, what he had appointed them for, and they knew that everything that needed done within the church couldn't be done by them. In fact, they even say it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry that we've been called to to wait on tables. It wouldn't be right for us to try to devote our time and attention and energy to these other matters when we've been called to this ministry. There's some wisdom there that we see a little bit absent from the apostles earlier on in the gospel accounts. So they come to the full gathering of believers and they say, elect from among yourselves seven men who are godly and filled with the Spirit to serve as the first deacons. And when the congregation puts forward these seven men, the apostles lay their hands on them and they commission them and appoint them to the ministry as the first deacons. That's an important role. It seems like they put a lot of thought and a lot of care, a lot of attention into who they chose here, right? The apostles didn't just say, all right, who wants to do it? It's not how they approached it. They said to the whole congregation of believers, those who you know are godly and honorable, who have servants' hearts. Pick them from among yourselves. Only seven. Remember, this was a movement now of thousands. And they said, pick seven, and they're going to serve in this office. Now, remind me again, what was the actual ministry that they were doing? Go ahead, tell me, what were they doing? Serving. They were feeding people, right? They were waiting on tables. That's a humble ministry, isn't it? We wouldn't probably think ourselves that that was a huge deal that required very godly, you know, holy, righteous people to lead. We'd probably think, all right, whoever's going to do it, we don't have that many to choose from, but let's get them to do it. And yet they put an incredible amount of thought and attention into who should be doing this ministry, feeding the orphans and the widows. Now, here's another question. Was that all that they did? If you know the rest of the story of Acts, even if you know the rest of chapter 6 and chapter 7 in Acts, was that the whole ministry of the deacons? Is all they did just wait on tables? No, of course not. They were still on mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was their base ministry. That's what they were entrusted and responsible for. And yet their greater ministry, as is all of ours, was to fulfill the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. And so we see as the next half of the chapter in Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7 unfolds, we actually see these deacons, and in particular Stephen, expanding out, reaching people in a powerful and effective way with the gospel of Jesus Christ, even though the actual ministry that he was first entrusted with was incredibly humble. 
Now, there's a whole other sermon that we could get on there that we don't have time to this morning. But I'm going to encourage you, if you're curious, or even if you just haven't heard the story before, go home later today and read Acts chapter 6 and 7. And you can look how this humble little ministry actually became a profound opportunity to reach people with the gospel. And then I think you'll see why the apostles here in Acts chapter 6 took appointing the right people so seriously. Now, in the church today, in the modern church, the office of deacon is actually often something that we don't really understand. It's often something that church to church, you'll see totally different models. You'll see a totally different understanding of what deacons do, what deacons are. In some churches, deacons effectively function the way that our elders in this church function. And so you have deacons who function as elders, and you have elders who function as pastors. And in other churches, you might have some people who are appointed as deacons but don't really do anything. And then in some churches, they don't even have deacons. The word will never be spoken. In general, deacons are just kind of a ministry that we don't fully get. Maybe back in the day we did, maybe not. Today, we don't really get a good handle on it very often. And that's an incredibly important thing to discuss. I'd encourage you to go and talk about that. Try and flush it out. Try and figure it out. Look at what Scripture has to say about the role of deacons and what exactly they are based on what we see in the function and the ministry in Scripture. I'd encourage you to go and talk about that and think about that. But for today, again, unfortunately, we don't have time to unpack that. So that's going to have to be a discussion for a different day. In the broad sense, the general 100-foot view, we can really get a good understanding of what a deacon is supposed to do just by understanding the origin and the name itself. In the broad sense, deacons serve. Fair? Deacons are servants, and they serve under the elders, doing that which the elders can't do because of their commitment to the word of God, and to leading the church. That's exactly what we see playing out here in Acts chapter 6. The elders, the apostles, they couldn't do it all, and so they appointed deacons to do the hands-on work of the ministry that they needed to delegate. So that's the function, the role, the purpose of deacons in the church in a broad, hundred-foot view sense. Now, having talked a little bit about deacons, I want to bring our attention back around to elders, where we talked about. We're going to give probably a lot more of our attention this morning for the rest of our sermon time towards the office of elders and overseers. You see, we talked about this title. We talked about the three different terms that we refer to the same role as, overseer, bishop, elder, but we didn't actually unpack their function in any sort of specific way. We didn't talk about the responsibilities of the elders in a biblical church. I said earlier that the elders are responsible for leading the church. That's something that we probably could all generally put our finger on. Well, the elders lead. That's true. But how? What does that mean? What do they actually do? And what does Scripture tell us about the role and responsibilities and purpose of elders? Thankfully, and I'm incredibly grateful, Scripture is actually very clear about that one. It spells it out very easily for us to understand what it is that elders are supposed to do. I'm going to throw just a handful of passages at you, and we can get a little bit of a feel for it. In 1 Timothy 3, 5, which we just read a moment ago, we see that elders are supposed to care for the church. There's supposed to be pastoral care involved in the ministry of elders. Now, that's a start, but that's not really very specific. So let's keep digging. In 1 Timothy 5, 17, Paul says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Well, there we get three responsibilities of the elders. The elders are to rule. Some of us don't really like that word that's being used there, and yet that's the word that Paul uses. They're to rule the church, they're to preach, and they're to teach. Those are certainly important ministries and functions within the church. In Titus 1.9, Paul says, referring to elders, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So yet again, we get this impression, this principle, this expectation of being able to teach. 
right? The elders are going to be teaching, giving instruction and sound doctrine. But then there's also a note of discipline and correction involved here, right? It says, must be able to correct those who contradict sound doctrine. So the elders are not only doing the teaching and the preaching, the teaching of sound doctrine, but also the correction when some wander away and contradict that sound doctrine. First Peter 1, I'm sorry, First Peter 5, 1 to 2, and in Acts 20, verse 28, the elders of the church are called to shepherd the flock. Shepherd the flock, care for the sheep, which they've been made overseers of by the chief shepherd, who's Christ. Now that term shepherd is going to be important just a little bit later, so pack that away in the back of your head. But the elders are called to shepherd the church. And in James 5, 14, the elders are called to pray over and anoint with oil the sick for healing when they're called upon. So here there's prayer, there's anointing, and there's actually visitation that's involved here. You see, in the New Testament, in James, when it talks about the elders being called upon and then coming and praying and anointing with oil, there's actually the picture in mind of going to those who are calling upon the elders, right? So when once somebody is, is bed-bound at home, they're sick, they're lame, whatever it might be, they're to call on the elders, and the elders will come and anoint them with oil and pray over them for healing. So there's visitation attached here. Are you guys getting the picture? You see, scriptural elders are meant to lead the church, not just in some abstract spiritual sense, not just in some kind of like vague, well, they're in charge, but not really. No, no, biblical elders are actually called to do the work of the ministry. They're called to be the ministers of the church. According to these passages that we just read, they're to be doing the teaching, the preaching, the discipline, the directing, the visitation, and the shepherding. Scripture lays it all out very clearly. That's exactly what the elders are supposed to be doing. Now, that might bring a question to your mind, a fair question, but an important question. Well, if all of that is what the elders are supposed to be doing, then what the heck is a pastor supposed to do? Fair question? If all of this stuff, the teaching, the preaching, the discipline, the directing, the visitation, all of that is supposed to be done by the elders, then what's the difference between an elder and a pastor? And I think that's an incredible question, because the only biblically consistent answer to that question is nothing. There is no difference between an elder and a pastor. There can't be, because the elders are the ones who are specifically told and entrusted to be doing all of these things. There is no difference. A pastor is an elder. To say otherwise is to create a totally new and unique role that we don't actually see in Scripture. It's to say, well, we've got these qualifications, we've got these responsibilities, we've got this role outlined for the elders who are supposed to lead the church and do all the ministry of the church, and then there's pastors. No role, no responsibilities, no qualifications, nothing in Scripture that's actually laid out for us whatsoever. Which is to say, it's describing something that's altogether unbiblical. In a scriptural model of church leadership, a pastor is an elder. There's no other model for church leadership that's present in scripture. Now you might say, well, that's nice, Aaron. Then why are you getting a paycheck? Again, fair question. Let's talk about it. The short answer, we could talk about the long answer another time, that's totally fine. There's a whole bunch of different scripture passages that we go to in order to explain and justify and, you know, from where we draw having paid pastoral staff. But the very short and practical answer to that question is that you need to have paid pastors, paid elders in the church to devote their time and attention to the church that someone working a job can't. That's practical. That's pragmatic. It's actually very simple. But we also see this consistently in Scripture. Paul, the other apostles, Titus, Timothy, plenty of other leaders that we see in the early church, they were supported by the church fellowship. They were supported by the body of believers so that they could give all of their time and attention and energy to the ministry. That's the consistent theme that we see. And yet we also see in Scripture that not everybody 
who was leading the church, not everybody who was involved in the church, not everybody who had responsibility in the church was financially supported. There was the presence of both, those who gave their total focus to the church and those who supported the church by working other jobs. You see, the reality, friends, is that the local church demands an amount of time and attention and commitment and focus that's very difficult to balance when you're also working a job on the side to care for your family. If you don't believe me, go ahead and ask Chris Fisher how much he liked being the head of the church while we were without a lead pastor for a year. I think, Chris, you were what, in the hospital like five times? Something like that, and he just wouldn't die. (laughs) The reality is that the weight to carry both working a full-time job, trying to get stuff done, and lead the church in the way that it needs to be led is just not feasible. So we have paid pastors, the word pastor coming from the Latin word shepherd. Now remember earlier I told you to back up in your head. Who was it that was called to shepherd the church? Jesus is the chief shepherd, and under Jesus is the elders. They were called to shepherd the church. Actually, all throughout Scripture, you have the elders and the apostles both calling themselves shepherds. So the elders are called to pastor the church. We use the word pastor to simply refer to an elder who's getting financially supported by the church to give his time and attention to the church. Are we understanding there? Are we all on the same page? It's okay if you disagree with me, but as long as we understand what's being said. Now, when we understand the significant responsibilities, the actual ministry of elders, overseers in the church, does it begin to make sense why there's such a steep list of qualifications for who can actually serve in that capacity? You see, if in our minds we've got this picture of what an elder is, and it's just someone who kind of shows up on Sunday and they hold the communion plate and that's it, Well, why should we be so selective about who does something like that? But if we understand that what biblical elders do is actually the ministry of the church, leading, teaching, preaching, disciplining, all of that, everything that's really weighty and impactful in the church, then certainly we need to have some high standards for who can do it. Look back with me at this list of qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7. Paul says, elders are to be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. They must manage their household well with dignity and keep their children submissive. They must not be a recent convert, and they must be well thought of by outsiders. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 9, where we see that almost identical list of qualifications for elders and overseers. It adds that aren't represented here in 1 Timothy 3, not arrogant, a lover of good, upright, holy, disciplined, and holds firm to the trustworthy word as taught. It's quite the list, don't you think? That's a pretty high standard. I think if we're honest, we would all say that that is a high standard to shoot for. And if we're really honest, we would admit that very few of us are ever going to live up to that high standard in completion. Very few of us are ever going to actually say, okay, we've arrived, we're meeting all of these qualifications, and certainly none of us are ever going to get to a point where we say, okay, we're finished. We've got all of this totally figured out, and there's not a single one of these areas in which we can continue to grow. None of us. You see, that's actually the point. That's actually the point of what Paul is communicating and instructing the church here. In our minds, we oftentimes have such a hard time with anything at all that strikes us as exclusive. Am I wrong about that? We as Americans or just as people or as believers, whatever it is, we have a hard time with exclusivity. It strikes us as wrong. Being exclusive is mean, right? We're supposed to always be inclusive of everybody at all times. And certainly, as far as the church goes, when it comes to corporate worship, everyone is welcome. There is no one who is excluded from this body of believers when we come together to worship the Lord and to respond to the gospel in faith. Everyone needs the gospel. It's not reserved for those who are good enough for it. 
that is all inclusive. But when we talk about leadership in the church, those who should actually be directing and guiding the church, friends, that is an exclusive ministry. 1 Timothy 5, 22. We're going to get to this later on as we work through Timothy, but for now, it's important for us to talk about it. In, in this passage in 1 Timothy 5, 22, Paul encourages Titus, he encourages the church, not to be hasty in the laying on of hands, meaning not to be hasty in appointing those who are in leadership, those who teach, those who serve. He's saying, take your time, be considerate, be thoughtful, be prayerful, be patient in this process of calling someone to lead. Now, we ought to ask the question, why? Why is it so important that we be patient and careful in this process? Why is there such a high standard that leaders in the church have to live up to? And why should anyone be excluded from that ministry? I think there are two good reasons to answer that question. You might not think they're good, but they're reasons nonetheless. The first is that leaders are held to a higher standard. That might strike us again as odd, but it's actually scripturally consistent. Leaders are held to a higher standard. The expectations and consequences for those who lead in the church are higher than they are for those who follow. They're more severe. James 3.1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. That's a puzzling passage, isn't it? We who teach will be judged with greater strictness. A similar passage we see in 1 Timothy 5, verses 19 to 20, where Paul is talking about handling and disciplining elders in the church. He says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. Again, that's a challenging passage, don't you think? Paul is basically saying to make an example of leaders who persist in sin so that those who are following them, those who have seen them in their sin, recognize and understand what God expects of his people and certainly what God expects of those who lead in the church. Jesus teaches the exact same principle with the parable of the wise and the wicked managers in Luke chapter 12, verses 41 to 48. We're not going to get into it this morning, but feel free to go and look later. You see, part of the reason why not everyone should lead the church, part of the reason, in fact, why leadership in the church is quite exclusive, is that by entrusting unqualified, incapable people with the care and direction of the church, we may be allowing them to bring judgment and condemnation on themselves and on the church. That's a serious thing for us to consider, friends. This restriction then to say that not everybody should do it and only those who are actually called and qualified to lead should be placed in positions of leadership, it's actually a restriction being made out of mercy. We don't want to see people who shouldn't be in those positions bringing judgment on themselves, bringing destruction on themselves. That would be irresponsible of us. It would be poor stewardship, and it actually would be unloving to set somebody up to go and fail. That's not loving. That's not kind. That's not generous. That's not caring for them. It's actually just thoughtless. Now, that's our first reason. The first reason why these qualifications are set high and why people should be excluded from leadership. The other reason that seems obvious to me and that you might find a little bit more pragmatic is that not many people are supposed to lead. In the church, not many are actually supposed to lead. Talking numerically, the percentage of people in the church who are supposed to lead the church is actually incredibly low. This is a church of somewhere around 160 people. You could argue with me on that. It doesn't really matter. We're in the ballpark of 160 people. We have six elders. Have you thought about that before? That's 3.8% of the church that's in charge of actually leading the church. Now, we've got other leaders. That's absolutely true. We've got input. We've got the governing board. That's all great. But at the end of the day, the head of this church, the highest authority in this church under Christ 
is the elders. Six men in charge of leading the church. Less than 4%. Now, friends, would you agree with me in saying that if we're going to trust six men, less than 4% of the church, to run and lead and direct the church, they ought to be in the top 4%. Is that fair to say? I mean, it seems logical in my mind. If we've only got a few spots here for who's going to be running this church, well, then we ought to pick the right ones. We ought to pick the best of the batch. It seems to me to just be incredibly logical. They better be in the top 4% in terms of righteousness and wisdom, the ability to lead. If the church is going to follow these men, they ought to stand out in the crowd. They ought to be well thought of. They ought to be above reproach. Their families ought to be examples of godly leadership, of a godly family, don't you think? It just makes good sense. But it also means, this high standard that Paul lays out for us here, it also means that even those who are called to be elders and pastors, those who are called to lead and direct the church, need to keep striving towards that standard of righteousness and godliness, that standard of holiness. We talked about this earlier. Is there ever going to be a time at which, at which any of us come to the end of the line and say, okay, I'm done. I've made it. No, certainly that's not the case. That's not how sanctification works. And we know that. We are all in ongoing process of sanctification. Jesus every day is making us to be more like him. And that's certainly true for those who are in leadership. Leaders are lifelong learners. And so we look at this standard that Paul sets up in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus chapter 1, and it might strike you that actually most of these qualifications are open-ended. Most of these qualifications are not just one line, but a spectrum. We can constantly grow in most of these areas that are described. In 1 Timothy 3, 1, right at the beginning of our scripture reading for this morning, Paul starts off by saying, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. You see, being a godly and effective leader in the church is something to strive for. It's a noble goal, but it's also a task. It involves some work. It involves some challenge on a daily basis sometimes. You're going to have to learn. You're going to have to teach. You're going to be put in uncomfortable situations. That's a part of the gig. And after all our hard work is done, After we've led the church faithfully for years, we're going to have to step back when God raises up someone else to lead. We're going to have to hand over the authority that we've been entrusted with, and we're going to have to watch them go and be honored. Watch them go and do their best to faithfully serve the Lord. We're going to have to make ourselves less so that they can become more, just like John the Baptist in John chapter 3 when Jesus comes on the scene. Again, this is part of the gig. It's not for our own glory that we serve. It's not for our own honor that we serve. It's not because we think that we have the answers and we can accomplish more than anyone else. No, those who are called to serve are to serve and to lead because they've been called to. It's as simple as that, friends. Not to make ourselves more in someone else's eyes. You see, I I think it's important to recognize when we look at this list of qualifications That in all of these areas, we can continue to grow. You might be the greatest Christian leader in the world, and yet if you're held up to the standard, do you think there might still be some room for you to increase? Are there any areas of your life in which you can be more above reproach, meaning there's no room for accusation about you? Can we learn to be more above reproach? Certainly. Is there room to be even more sober-minded? even more self-controlled, even more respectable, even more hospitable? Can we be any gentler? Can we be any less quarrelsome? Is it possible for us to lead our households any better? You see, Paul gave us this list of qualifications to discern who should and shouldn't be leading the church. But it also shows us what those who are leading the church are supposed to be striving for and working towards. We're not allowed to just sit back And say, well, this is as good as it's going to get. No, we are constantly to be striving towards this standard that God sets for us. 
Can we be even more humble, even better teachers? Can we be even more known by the community as godly men and witnesses for Christ? You see, Paul set a high bar for leaders here in 1 Timothy 3 to prevent those who shouldn't be leading from stepping into positions of leadership, to show us who should be leading in those positions, and to give those who are called something to strive for, a standard to live up to as they serve, constantly growing in Christ's likeness and in our capacity to represent him well. Now, I know that I've gone on for a while. We're going to finish up in just a moment here. But before we do, I think there's one other question that we need to wrestle with this morning, and it's an important one. What happens when we lower the bar that Paul set for leaders in the church? What happens when we don't take these qualifications seriously or we don't give them thought as we appoint people to leadership? What's the result when we bend them or we work around them in order to include people that these qualifications would exclude? That's an important question, don't you think? Now, interestingly enough, it's not one that really has to be spelled out for most of us because most of us have seen it. Most of us have seen what happens when people who would be restricted and excluded from leadership according to these qualifications step into it. We've seen it. If those who lead aren't above reproach, they'll become hypocrites. They'll say one thing and do another. And friends, I've said this already, there's nothing that drives people away from the church quicker than hypocrisy. When leaders have broken homes, be it failed marriages or failing marriages or unsubmissive, unfaithful children, or an inability of some kind to act as the head of their home, it affects and impacts their ability to lead. Paul even says here in 1 Timothy 3, For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? It's a profound significance. If a leader is a recent convert, Paul says that he might become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation. If he's not thought of well by outsiders, he might fall into disgrace, and he might act as a poor witness to the world about the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is exactly what Paul just spelled out for us in the previous chapter, that our lives are witnesses. If our leaders aren't sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach, no one will ever follow them. At best, they'll be inefficient and incapable in the position that they've been entrusted with, and at worst... They'll become abusive and destructive, and they'll tear the place down around them. And friends, we've seen that, haven't we? Maybe not in this church, but in churches. I've heard plenty of horror stories about those who shouldn't have been in leadership stepping into leadership and tearing stuff apart, and I'm sure many of you have as well. Would anyone here say that they really want our church to be led by violent, quarrelsome drunks who love money? Seems like a fair standard to set. Ah, maybe let's not pick those ones. And yet, friends, it happens. Certainly it happens. I've heard stories about selfish, stubborn, ignorant leaders who drove the church into the ground. Stories about leaders who tore the place apart to get their own way or who led faithful churches into heresy and faithlessness by teaching false doctrine and misleading Paul gives us these qualifications to protect the church from those who shouldn't be leading, stepping into positions of leadership. But if we allow them to flex or we overlook issues and failures because we don't want to tell people no, we don't want to come across as exclusive, both the church and the individuals being placed where they don't belong are going to pay the price. It's going to hurt. It's going to bring judgment. It's going to bring destruction. And that's a sad thing to see. But friends, even more importantly, it's going to hurt our witness to the world. When unbelievers walk into our churches and they see chaos, disorder, selfishness, and failure, it might cost them their trust. It might cost them their opportunity to respond to the gospel and faith when they turn around and walk out because that place is a mess. Now, I'm not saying that we're never going to be a mess. I'm not saying that we're never going to have disagreements, we're never going to have discord. We're a family. That happens. It's okay. But there's a difference 
between surrendering ourselves to foolishness and to poor leadership because we don't want to tell people who want to do something no and leading well with integrity and sometimes it being messy. There's a difference involved there. You see, when we compromise on qualifications for those who lead, in effect, we are sacrificing our witness to the world about the gospel of Jesus Christ to make people who God has said shouldn't be leading feel included. And that, friends, is a sad situation to be in. The reality is that the church needs to be led. We need godly elders and deacons. We need godly ministry heads and workers. We need godly servants. The church has to be run. It has to function. It has to be led. But to step into leadership in the church is something significant. Paul calls aspiring to be an overseer a noble task. The same is true for all who serve and lead and contribute to the ministry of the church. It's a good thing. It's a noble and honorable thing to desire and to strive for. But friends, God has been very clear with us about who should be leading. The bar has been set, and it's been set high intentionally. We can either complain about it, feel sorry for ourselves about it. We can ignore it. We can neglect it. We can make excuses, or we can strive for it. We can pursue righteousness and holiness in every area of our lives and commit to the Lord that that is what we want to be. That high bar that was set for who can lead the church, I want to be like that. And if I'm not like that right now, then Lord Jesus, please change me to be like that. Work sanctifying in my heart. Change my life, change my marriage, change my family, save my kids. Whatever it might be that would restrict me from that leadership, let's actually lean into the Lord and trust him to change anything in our lives that isn't the way that he has created it to be. For those who are called to lead, let's lead not for status, not for power or control, not to raise ourselves up above others in our own minds, but as servants to Christ, the chief shepherd who taught us what it means to serve as he knelt down and washed the feet of his disciples. That's the type of servant leadership that we're called to in the church. Not some high status platform, but servanthood, humility. For those who haven't been called to lead, don't look at those who are leading with jealousy and envy. Don't look at those who have been placed in authority over you by God with some sort of contempt or rebellious spirit. Why don't you partner with them and give God thanks for the honor that's been bestowed upon them? Friends, pray for your leaders. They need it. We're all still a work in progress. We need prayers from everyone who we're leading every day to not be what we're not supposed to be. If we're going to live up to this standard as elders and overseers and deacons, leaders in the church, we need your help. So pray for those who are in leadership. Don't make yourself an opponent or an obstacle to them. I'm going to read two quick passages of scripture and then we're done. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, worship team can go ahead and start working their way up. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 21 to 26, speaking about the body of Christ, which is the church. Paul says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Romans 12, 9 through 13, Paul says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Today, church, my call to you is to outdo one another in showing honor. That's Paul's call here in Romans chapter 12. Let's outdo one another. 
as we show honor to one another. Let's submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's serve in the manner that Jesus taught us, humbly and out of a great depth of love for each other. God has called those who lead to live up to a high standard. As brothers and sisters in Christ, let's strive for that standard together. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we love you. Lord, we're so grateful that you've taught us how to be righteous. We're so grateful that you've made your expectations for us clear, that we don't have to guess at it. We don't have to just try to figure it out as we go. Lord, you've told us. And not only that, you've given us the power to actually achieve it by your spirit who's alive within us. So Lord Jesus, all you actually need from us is just our surrender, our cooperation, our willingness to be made into whatever it is you want to make us into. So Jesus, this morning, would you draw us into that kind of trust? Would you draw us into that kind of submission, that kind of surrender, that kind of faith that we can put ourselves in your hands and say, we trust you, Jesus. Do with us what you want. You know better than we do. Lord, we give ourselves to you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand and continue to worship with us.
This morning, I think we can appreciate the fact that God sets a high standard because he wants what's best for his church. His bride, this body of believers that he cares so greatly for, he wants to bless it. He wants to see us achieve our potential. He wants to lead us into his promises. So this morning, let's get behind God's standard. Let's get behind what he has said is best for us. Let's submit to him. And let's go out as examples of the gospel of Jesus Christ, ambassadors for his kingdom, and commit to living up to that standard, striving for righteousness that he's taught us about. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go this week and be an example for Christ. Amen.